Welcome back to Meet Me in the Middle. Thank you so much for being here. This is your host, Neely, and I just want to remind you to please share, like, comment wherever you listen to your podcast. My website has many links to the information shared in each episode. This allows you to check the facts and dig deeper. I also have social media links there too. Please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, and Facebook. I also, if you like me, like to still hold a book in your hand, then please visit the shop on my website and buy a book. I post books that help us build our understanding, our opinions, and varying views. In this episode, we are covering the campaigns, committees, and conventions. We'll go into campaign finance laws and lobbying. We'll focus on the presidential elections, the primaries versus the general. And before we get into this episode, I want to recap a bit about the election laws and electoral college. There was much debate at the Constitutional Convention on how the president would be elected, and it's changed over time as we have discussed in previous episodes. I want to talk about why the presidential election is so different to the House of Representatives, Senators, and State elections. It's the fact, the history, the fact is the northern part of the nation had a larger population, and the southern part of the nation had a heavy slave population. The plantain, plantation owners were worried about the lack of representation. Originally, the idea is that Congress would elect the president, but that didn't cohere with the separation balance of power. Also, slaves could not vote for representation, so the Electoral College was born. The idea was first to count all slaves as three-fifths of a person for the purpose of the number of representatives and the number of electoral college votes by state. Then the questions came as who and how the electors would be chosen. So the discussions began as the people would elect delegates, a body of men of means and reputation. This passed. So Virginia and Pennsylvania had almost an equal number of free persons, but because of the number of slaves in Virginia, they had gained three extra seats in the House and therefore six more electors. Because of this, 32 of the first 36 years the office of the president was occupied by a slave-owning Virginian, except John Adams. The electors in seven out of the 16 states were chosen by the people by district. All the rest were the electors were chosen by the state legislators. The original idea is for the elections, electors, to use their own judgment when electing the president. The first two elections, there was really no decision to be made as George Washington ran unopposed for two terms. However, by 1796, the two parties had emerged. The party leaders believed they should elect who we appointed as electors. The 1800 election was a turning point. The Federalists and the Republicans came together to fix how the system would work, then held a meeting called a caucus. The word caucus is an Algonquin word for advisor. The candidates themselves did not campaign as it was seen as a form of demagoguery. Also, the ideas of religious beliefs came into this discussion. The campaigns were mainly printed in the newspapers. Jefferson was committed to religious toleration, and I quote, 
It does me no injury for my neighbor to say there are many gods or no god. And, quote, it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. Preachers were very vocal about having a president of God and absolutely opposed to having a president that was not aligned to a God. Also, voting was done in person, in town hall settings, counting heads. The top of heads were known as polls. People would stand on one side or the other to be counted. No pen or paper were known. Polls are now known as voters. Then there was the ballot. This word came from the word little ball. This was done not by paper, but by throwing a ball into a specific basket. Alexander Hamilton wanted a constitutional amendment that the electors be voted for by district. This never made it to the floor, as we have previously discussed. So today, we are left with the parties nominating their slate of electors. When we vote in the general election, the slate of electors that that party puts forward dependent on whoever won the popular vote of the state, that slate of electors are chosen and then certified before they vote in December after we voted in November, which is then read out and tallied in Congress in January before the inauguration. So a state with five electors, the Republican party puts forward five electors and the Democrats put forward five electors. If the state general election goes to the Republican candidate by popular vote, the five electors that the Republicans put forward as their slate are the ones who officially vote for the president, except in Maine and Nebraska, which is nominated by the legislators, counted by the district, the first two votes follow the popular vote, and the three left by congressional district allocated votes based on the popular vote of the district. All the other states are a winner-take-all and have varying, o- varying oaths and rules of how the electors will vote. Remember, Washington warned us about party affiliation, as many founders did. There are many books on this subject of all the discussions in the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, the speeches that were given on the floor at the Constitutional Convention. And they were very concerned about party affiliation And now, our elections are being run by the parties. So let's get into the campaigns, committees, and the conventions. You can follow along on my website, findunityinthemiddle.com, under the episode resources section. All links are there, so let's get into it. Let's look first at the party platforms over time. There have been many parties that have been put forward for presidential elections. So let's talk about their platforms. The Federalist Party, they were main platforms were about banking, manufacturing, urbanization, strong federal government and support of industry over agriculture. The Democratic Republican Party's main platforms were states' rights, frontier expansion, republicanism, isolationism, civil liberties, support of agriculture over industry. The National Republican Party, which took over from the Federalist Party and the Jackson, uh, the Jacobianism, um, was federally backed 
internal improvements of federal banks, business, and industry, and protective tariffs. The anti-Masonic party were all about ending the influence of Freemasonry over the state and U.S. politics, internal improvements, and protective tariffs. The Democratic Party of the 19th century, their main platform was states' rights, frontier expansion, opposition to abolition, manifest destiny, popular sovereignty, rights of the common American, low tariffs, big business, especially later in the century. The Whig Party was protective tariffs, internal improvements, and infrastructure, less centralized executive branch with limited veto power, national banks, and education reform. The Free Soil Party's platform was opposition to slavery's expansion into the U.S. territories, moderate tariffs to raise government revenue, Subsidy, subsidies on limited basis for internal improvements and enactment of a homestead law. The Republican Party of the 19th century were focused on abolition, unionism, protective tariffs, industrialization and urbanization, banking, gold standard, temperance, civil rights, and antitrust laws. The American Party, which also were kind of known as the Know Nothings Party, were all about anti-immigration, anti-Catholicism, prohibition, and unionism. The Constitutional Union Party was all about constitutionalism and unionism. The People's Party was anti-elitism, bimetallism, ag Gregonianism, labor unions, and wealth distribution. The Socialist Party of America was about social democracy, labor unions, women's suffrage, wealth distribution, Marxism, opposition to capitalism, and fascism. The Progressive Party was about the regulation of business, lower tariffs, women's suffrage, workers' rights, and protections, social welfare, and direct democracy. The 20th and the 21st century Republican Party is about corporate interest, isolationism early in the century, interventionism and large military, low taxes, small government, civil rights, balanced budgets, states' rights, welfare reform, moralism, national security, and border control. The 20th and 21st century Democratic Party is about antitrust laws, economic regulations, strong federal government, social welfare, civil rights, women's rights, interventionism, larger military, anti-poverty, labor unions, health care reform, gun control, and marriage equality. The state's rights Democratic Party were about segregation, opposition to civil rights, legislation, states' rights. The American Independent Party. Ultra-conservative policies, states' rights, tax reform, religious freedom, pro-gun, pro-life, anti-gay marriage. The Libertarian Party were about personal, corporate, and civil liberties, small government, small military, neutrality in foreign affairs, abortion rights, legalization of recreational drugs, free trade, open immigration, abolition of marriage as a legal contract, support of same-sex unions, and elimination of income tax. The Reform Party were all about campaign finance reform, including the elimination of political action committees, constitutional amendments requiring a balanced budget and limiting congressional terms, opposition to free trade agreements in order to protect U.S. jobs, direct election of the president by popular vote, tax reform, and secure borders. 
the Constitution Party, so right-wing policies, nationalism, isolationism, anti-tax, anti-federal government, pro-gun, anti-immigration, strict constitutionalism, and Christian moralism. The Green Party was more of a left-wing policies, universal health care, environmentalism, small military, social justice, women's rights, civil rights, marriage equality, and nonviolence. As you can see how there were so many parties and so many platforms over time and how they've switched and how the Republican Party was very much about building a federal government where now it seems like the Democrats are much more focused on a federal government. Do you see how these parties have changed over time? It's very fascinating when you really look into it. But by examining the political parties that have come and gone, as well as looking at how the two major parties have changed over time, It can be said that at certain points, it was hard to tell them apart. Both have gone through periods of liberalism and conservatism, and both have had their extremes. They have switched positions on a variety of topics. Today, the differences are pretty vast and pretty clear. The media and the flow of information has led us to a place where an already divided nation is being pushed further and further by the opinions of the powerful media organizations and opinions being packaged as facts. This is why we are here today. Divided we fall, together we stand. Both the liberal and conservatives, depending on the subject, both parties have been liberal and conservative, depending on the subjects. And that is what we really need to embrace. Opposing opinions have led us to great opportunities and change. But today it can feel leaving us stagnant and angry and leads to really slow progress on important issues. It's like moving at a snail's pace or even at times feeling like we take two steps forward and three steps back. This is why we need regulations, or for a better word, standards of media presentation. Opinions versus news matters. Not to squash opposing views, but to keep the integrity of information that is now more than ever on tap. The introduction of AI, computer-driven voices and arguments, is going to drive this further, and this will be a topic for a later time. So in order to really have a candidate on the ballot, they must register first as a party. The party itself must register And since the establishment of the Federal Elections Commission in in 1975, which was really there to enforce the Federal Election Campaigns Acts that were passed in 1867 and 1971, and many laws existed to control the federal elections and the influences. However, these laws were mostly ignored because there was no central depository of information for reporting and requirements for reporting. And so since 1975, the Federal Elections Commission became that depository and the overarching rules for how elections would be run and how information would flow about campaign finance and such limits and rules. A lot were repealed, implemented over the years, and a lot of this is being driven at a state level. So when a new party wants to register, they must register with the FEC. Once they raise or spend money over a certain threshold in connection to a federal election, they must register with the Federal Exchange Commission. However, if a party is only working at a state or local level, it does not need to register with the FEC, but it will need to follow the registration processes of the state. 
So party registration is the first point. Once the FEC grants active status to that party, then they have to follow all the rules and reporting requirements. Each state has their rules on ballot access, and it's important to understand these rules. They are vast and varying across the states. The rules are also different for how state elections are run versus federal elections. So looking at how these, the two-party system has taken control of the elections and the Elector College and the congressional mapping and so on and so on. The power that they hold is why the founders were warning us constantly in the early years. There are three types of groups slash activities that influence what candidates appear on your ballot. One, lobbyists. Two, the political action committees known as PACs and the parties themselves, the DNC, the RNC. These are not just one-time conventions that you see once a year. These are large organizations that run the campaigns for everything from local level of a mayor to a city council member all the way to president. Each state has different rules for lobbyists, how they register, and how the public can access the lobbying list for each state. Some states are very transparent. Some states are not as transparent. However, every state does require lobbyists to register. Churches and nonprofits are not allowed to contribute to political campaigns. However, they do hire lobbyist groups and donate to PACs to get around these laws. A lobbyist role is really, and there are, there are many lobbyists for good and bad. The rules are the same, however. The PACs and lobbyists are in the tens of thousands. They all raise money. They hold fundraising events. They contribute to campaigns to boost their agenda with a candidate, with a kind of unspoken promise. We will help you get elected if you promise to push policies that advanced our cause. And some of these are for good, and some of them are not. Some are aligned to political parties, and some are not. Prime examples of these are oil companies versus environmental groups. Pro-life versus pro-choice. Gun safety versus gun freedom. These are powerful. The political action committees and the lobbyists and the limits on how much they can, they can be paid directly to candidates and campaigns are very clear. The reporting requirements are detailed in the way that they get around these rules are also many. Some PACs, like I said, are aligned with a party. Some are nonpartisan, but ultimately choose a side, as we must do when we vote. The money involved in any political campaign is measured closely by the conventions, the DNC and the RNC. Fundraising milestones are key to party nominations. You've all gotten the text and the emails, help us within the next 24 hour reach these milestones. These are key to be pushed forward as a key nomination, even before the primary. In order to stay on the stage, it's really about the money they raise. Because until the primary vote, no one really knows what the numbers of voters are going to be. So they focus on the money that was raised. And since the money that is raised is varying by candidate, depending on their platform and party affiliation, that's how the two parties stay in power. Let's think about that. It's not really vote, voter numbers that keep these people on that stage, even though we really like a specific candidate as a voter. If they don't raise the money milestones, they get dropped out before the primary happens. 
We saw this very clearly in 2016 with Bernie versus Hillary. Money talks. The power of the DNC and the RNC drives the candidates on the ballot. The primary is really important to participate because this is the voices of who we believe should be the candidates on the ballot for the general election. However, being able to vote in a primary really depends on what party you're affiliated with. And if you're like me, with no party affiliation, it makes it difficult, as in some states you have to register to vote in that primary. Some primaries are open, some primaries are closed, some primaries are partially opened, changed by year over year. It's very confusing. And this party affiliation, we're going to talk about a little bit more in the voting series at voter registration, but it's very important to understand how the states run their primaries and the parties, how they allow people to vote in the primaries. This drives candidates who are the party delegates local, statewide, House, and Senate, and President. No matter what or who, they have an overarching platform to push forward the party's agenda. Having the focus on campaign dollars distorts the issues of character, integrity, and suitability for office. We see this all the time on both sides. The limits of contributions by individuals, as well as by PACs, by party, by unions, is all very different. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to just expose this for the top four states. And then I do have a link that allows you to go into it in great detail. So in Florida, an individual contribution to a candidate is limited on a statewide or candidate and it's three thousand dollars per person for a statewide or senator a legislative or other judicial candidate is a thousand dollars per person per election for the state party to the candidate contribution a candidate for statewide office may accept contributions from the party uh, with an aggregate not to exceed $250,000. A legislative candidate can accept up to $50,000 from the party, from the national or state executive committee, but cannot be combined at more than fifty. A PAC and corporate and union contributions to the candidates are the same as the individual limits. 3000 for statewide, 1000 for judicial. In California, the individual to candidate contributions are 32000 for governor candidate, 8100 for a statewide candidate, 4900 to the legislative candidate and 4,900 to a city and county candidate. This is per election cycle, per individual. The state party contributions to a candidate are 4,900 for city and county. Otherwise, all others are unlimited. The PAC candidate to the candidate Small contributor committees, it's 32000 same as the individual. 16000 for statewide, for a governor, and then 16000 for statewide candidate. 9700 for a legislative candidate. 9700 for city and county candidates. The regular PACs, the big PACs, it's same as individual contributions. For corporate and union candidate contributions, it's the same as individual as well in California. New York, very different. So for the primary, statewide is 22,000 for an individual contribution to a candidate. 
for a Senate candidate is 7,500 and 4,700 for an assembly candidate. Family limits apply also in the primary. For statewide, it's 155,000. So it's 22,000 per person, but 155,000 per family. And in the Senate, it's uh, 49,000. And in the Assembly, it's 21,000. The general election limits are different. Statewide candidate is 47,100. A Senate candidate is 11,800. And Assembly candidate is 4,700. Family limits also apply to the general election for individual contributions. So a family can contribute no more than 310000 For a statewide candidate, a Senate candidate is 60000 and an Assembly candidate is 26000 These amounts are per election cycle. In New York, the state party to candidate is prohibited in the primary election for any money to be paid or contributed from a state party. However, it's unlimited in a general election. For the PACs, it's same as the individual limits. For corporations, it's same as individual limits with exceptions. Corporations are limited to 5000 per year in aggregate contributions to New York State candidates and commission committees per year. Candidates may accept corporate contributions of up to 5000 annually during each election cycle as long as the total um, from a corporation does not exceed the election cycle's regular limits on individual contributions does not exceed 5000 Unions is the same as individual limits. Texas. Individual is unlimited. State party is unlimited. PAC unlimited. Corporate, prohibited. Unions, prohibited. As you can see, the differences of how campaign finance is managed in each state is very different. And considering that the conventions are looking at fundraising dollars as a major reason for keeping someone on that stage as a potential nominee, with states that have unlimited fundraising, you can see how quickly this can grow on a candidate level at a convention party level. The party's power has been a problem for centuries. The founders saw the danger and warned us, but we have allowed this to become the norm. And just because it feels irreversible, it is not. This whole podcast is about shedding light on how it was designed, the history of change, and how it's run today. Candidates did not campaign in person as this was seen as demagoguery. And now this is blasted on TV, social media, day in and day out. Lobbying laws and PACs and conventions have driven the divide even further. The fact a candidate for president or any candidate has first to pledge allegiance to a party is where this is, has really gone wrong. The fact that candidates are not considered for nomination if not meeting fundraising goals is another form of corruption, in my opinion, to our representation. Local and state level is more closely aligned to the intentions of the founders, but also corrupted by campaign dollars. However, not as much as it is for presidential nominations. This concludes this episode. The next episode, we're going to talk about voting registration, voting rights, primary versus general election night, and electoral votes. Thank you so much for listening. And please visit my website. Please connect with me on social media. Look at your state laws. The more we know, the more we grow. We have the power. The structure supports us, the people. If we want change, we must dilute the power of the party and take back the power to the people. Until next time, meet me in the middle. That's where I'll be. Thank you for listening.